Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into core. When I first got into fitness, this was really the only muscle group that I cared about. Really? Yes. This was all that I wanted was to have a six pack or to have a flat midsection. And I would be looking up different things on Pinterest of all different kinds of ab workouts. I'm probably still have screenshots on my phone of like, do this five minute ab circuit and it's guaranteed flat tummy because that's really all that I did. And starting out, I would go and I would run or do cardio. And then I would just sit in this little alcove and I would do like 300 crunches just trying to get apps. That was like my main goal. This is going to be a very unique episode because I come from the opposite side where I thought that everyone just had abs to begin (laughs) with because my beginning point was through athletics and sprinting and jumping and having lateral movement where my core was very important. Thus, I was able to build a strong core. Swinging a baseball bat is going to be a big part of that. So very interesting to hear both sides Mm -hmm. as I have now realized not swinging a baseball bat anymore, (laughs) not running on a football field anymore. And so having to do some actual direct training to my core now as an adult is going to be a nice little perspective for the entire episode. And it was something where I like literally now understanding how to engage my core. I do understand I like had no core strength up until I was a year or so into college. And probably the most that I've actually been like that clicking moment has been in the past few years with my midsection. But it's also something looking at a woman Obviously, our fat distribution is a little bit different, and so it can be something really frustrating that I just know women deal with because I am a woman, and I've talked to multiple other women of how we're distributing more fat towards our midsection and hips, and that can be a really frustrating thing of like that lower pooch that everyone's just trying to get rid of. Uh, So I think that having those, again, contrasting male, female, abs, no abs will be good as we go through this. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and dive into what all is contributing to the abs and the core. And I'm going to make some uh, discernments here of being able to talk about the core, the inner core or the deep core, and then talking about what the whole trunk is going to be. Because I think knowing the difference of those when I'm describing them and when we're talking about them is going to be very helpful. So the four main muscles that we're going to be talking about today are going to be all in the abs. So it's going to be the rectus abdominis, the external oblique, the internal oblique, and then the TVA, which would also be the transverse abdominis. And these are going to be strong bands of muscle lining the walls of your abdomen, and they're located towards the front of your body, so between your ribs and pelvis. So then when I talk about the inner core unit, that is going to also include the TVA, but then it's going to have the diaphragm, the multifidus, and the pelvic floor, which I'm not going to dive too much into the pelvic floor this episode because I'm so jazzed for the next episode, the guest episode with James, you guys dive in a lot about the pelvic floor, correct? Absolutely. A lot. (laughs) It is jam-packed with some incredible conversation. I know as you left that conversation, you're like, we could have talked for another hour. There was so much to cover. So that's going to be awesome to be able to look at. But when I talk about the trunk, so I used to look at it as like the core box, which you can still use that term. But the trunk is also going to include different things within like your spine and everything around that center core area. So when I say core, some people can be talking about your whole core trunk area, but today's episode is really going to be about those four main muscles that I talked about. Absolutely. I mean, where do you want to start? You did a great job of opening it up and letting everyone know the 
that it is much more than just what you see visually, mm -hmm. because two of the specifics that you shared are going to be ones that we do not see externally. No matter how lean you get, you're only going to see two of those four. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into kind of where those all, all are. And I'm not going to talk about origin and insertion. I can put them on the cheat sheet, which don't forget that there is a cheat sheet for each episode and you can check the show notes. But I think that that's going to be way too much jargon talking about each individual of the four muscles, where they insert, where they originate, and going into all of that. So I really want to talk about them in reference to each other. Um, and again, that cheat sheet's going to have that visual where you can see the difference in each of them, which is going to be really helpful. So I think starting with the most superficial later, layer, and then we can kind of go deeper into our core. Um, but this one is probably also the most popular too and the one that a lot of exercises bias um, when we look at like the average crunch or sit up and that's gonna be the rectus abdominis. So that is the most superficial layer and that's also what a lot of people are gonna see as that six pack. So these run vertically down either side of your abdomen and again from your ribs to the front of your pelvis. So it's really involved in flexion through the trunk and the spine and you're thinking about because it's attaching in that like rib sternum area near the hips, they bring those two places closer together. So that's what I mentioned about your average crunch or sit up is really going to be targeting this rectus abdominis. And they're divided into two segments uh, by a muscle called the linea alba. And then your rectus abdominis also holds your internal organs in place. So it's not just a pretty thing to look at. Uh, it can also keep all of your organs like your pancreas, your intestines, um, your liver, everything, make sure that it's all in a good spot there. Um, and it can also help with a lot of things. So I know in past episodes, we've talked about what the daily activities you use, and we're going to talk about those. But I think also talking about them directly in each muscle is going to be helpful. So with the rectus abdominis, what's a way that you use that in your daily life? On a literal daily basis, you're going to be using it to just get out of bed. Now, um, some of you may not be using as much actual strength of the rectus abdominis. You may be generating a little bit of rocking, a little <laughs> bit of momentum to get your butt out of bed. But in the general sense of lifting your chest and being able to sit up out of bed, the rectus abdominis is going to be a helpful hand in doing so. Mm -hmm. And it keeps your body stable throughout movement. So it's also a big part of trunk rotation. Uh, and it can even be something as like fishing something out of your pocket and bending over that that's going to be really using that rectus abdominis. Absolutely. From a visual standpoint, do we want to talk about that in tandem now or sure. do we want to go? Okay. So with the the visual side, I, I would say one of the most common questions that I get is how can I change the structure of my abs? How can I get those blocky abs that are just right next to one another, the same size, and it's just boom, 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 boom. Can we change the structure or visual representation of our abs? I would like to. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's going to be much more genetic. We can change the density of the tissue, mm -hmm. but in terms of making it a very symmetrical visual, that's going to be something where you need to thank your parents <laughs> or curse your parents, one or the other, um, for that, because that is going to be something that's more dependent on genetics than anything. Are genetics also going to go into if you can have like a six pack versus an eight or a 12 pack? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like what determines the amount of the pack? My understanding is the length of space between the ribs and the pelvis. Mm -hmm. So a taller individual is going to have potentially a greater ability to have more packs to the <laughs> abdomen itself, um, where someone with a shorter torso may even just have like a four pack, for example. Well, thank you for clearing that up when it comes to the different packs that we can have on our rectus abdominis or our six pack. So let's go ahead and dive into some of these other muscles. So talking about the external obliques, which are going to be the next um, when we're looking at the different layers here, they're going to kind of be in the same layer, so to speak, as that rectus abdominis. And then these next two ones we'll talk about go a little bit deeper, um, but it's going to be a pair of muscles. So it's one on each side lining up with that rectus abdominis and 
they are going to be the largest of the flat muscles. Um, and they run from the sides of your body towards the middle. And they allow for your trunk to twist from side to side. So working with, again, some rotation as well as that side bending. So being able to do basically anything side to side. Yeah, helping with that lateral over, lateral flexion. And with the obliques, this is coming back to swinging a baseball bat. So I am left-handed, meaning that I would pull the bat towards my right side. My right obliques have significantly greater rotation ability and overall strength because of just the repetitive nature of me rotating towards that side comparatively to my left obliques mm -hmm. that do not have the same ability or have not contributed to the same amount of actions in that rotation of my core. And if you are someone who consistently plays golf, you may feel the same way with the whatever direction you are constantly swinging a golf club because that's going to impact. And so the way that I have gone about my training to address some of this is just putting a little bit more emphasis and time on the side that does not have as much capabilities or the amount of repetitions because this side of my uh, core with my obliques has had millions of <laughs> repetitions that my left side just has not had. And so I'm never going to catch up. It's not going to be a matter of like, I'm trying to get it to match. It's just going to be a matter of, I spend a little bit more time on my left side relative to my right side. And a lot of you are going to have this when it comes to your core strength, if you're coming from a sport um, earlier in your life or just having a dominant side in general. A hundred percent. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I think sometimes people struggle of, okay, if one side is more developed, then I feel like I should do things the same because that's what's in the program or that's what I should do. But really being able to look at if you have those imbalances, the way to fix them is just by putting a little bit more emphasis because like you said, that side is way in front of that side. So you need to catch up uh, with it and just being able to be aware of that instead of looking at them of, oh, they're both my uh, oblique, so they should be the same. It's like, I got them on both sides. Let me just make sure that they're working the way that they need to. I would add that from a visual perspective, that this is probably one of the cooler, like a six yeah. pack is cool, but if you are able to have a very lean and detailed oblique, mm -hmm. I would say it's the coolest And thing. they got those gills. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, very cool. I've never been one to have like a very etched out six pack uh, genetic wise, uh, but when it comes to those obliques, that is like something that I really love on my physique of being able to showcase. Yeah. So you have the serratus anterior, which is going to run up more towards the armpit. And if someone's having more detail there, they're really lean. Mm -hmm. And so then that's going to go into the those external obliques and really showcase all those muscle fibers are running more at like a 45 degree angle. And so it all just like flows nicely to the lower abdomen. And from a presentation standpoint, when someone's able to have that tissue, it really creates that V taper that we've talked about through other episodes. Um, and is, yeah, a very cool visual part of a well made physique. Yes. And we also talked in other episodes, um, and you've kind of already mentioned it, of talking about the swinging a bat and swinging of a golf club. Um, and those also are going to use the lats a good amount. The lats and the core, because they are, again, near that core box and that trunk unit, they are going to overlap with a lot of the work that they help with. And so we talked about within lat training, chopping wood. And that's another thing that your external obliques or your obliques altogether are going to be really involved in because again that rotational movement that side bend that twist um, is really going to play a role here the one thing i will add before we go into the other two is that one of the most misdone muscle groups in terms of training of just like rushing through and not having a great range of motion and so on and we'll talk about that more as we get into the often miscues but this is the one that gets so on my nerves mm -hmm. that i have to correct in exercises so frequently to improve the range of motion and having a better overall emphasis that the quality of repetition for all things including abs is going to be far more important than the amount of repetitions that are being performed 
I think that that comes the clearest to me when we're in a yoga class because there's always a section in the classes that we go to of like, okay, we're going to do a minute or two of abs and they put an exercise in place. And I am often one of the main people doing some sort of change or modification to what movement they are doing because they're trying to do it at a certain count and trying to really push people to move through it. But I am very aware of if I'm not truly engaging and really being able to bring my core together, I'm not going to get much benefit. So just moving through space as I do, let's say, a bicycle crunch or if I do flutter kicks or something like that, I could end up actually causing more strain and pain to my core instead of actually helping it if I'm not engaging it correctly. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible You should you. lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are low needed. Keto Squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great You should squat ass to grass. Toes. It's fine. It fits my mask. Idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. I could not agree more. Tell us about the internal obliques. Well, the internal obliques are in a very similar location to the external obliques. They're just a little bit deeper, and they're just inside your hip bones as well, and they're much thinner and smaller than the external obliques, but they're still on the side of your rectus abdominis like the external, and they're running from the side of your trunk towards the middle, and they work with the external to allow your trunk to twist from side to side. So it's really aiding in a lot of the things that the external obliques are doing. If you guys remember in the glute episode, we had talked about the glute medius and the glute minimus and the minimus being very similar to the function of the glute medius and it being right under where that glute medius is, the internal obliques are going to function very similarly to the external obliques in the way that we talked about with the glute med and the glute min. A hundred percent. And this is again going to be that rotation of the trunk and even that flexing laterally um, as you go through a movement. Absolutely. What's the what's the last one? The transverse abdominis. This is actually one of my personal favorites, not only to train, uh, but to be able to talk about because it is so deep. It is the deepest of um, the core muscles. Muscles. It's something where kind of like back and lats, you can't see it. It's harder to connect to it. But this has been one that has kind of been a labor of love for me to figure out how to truly connect to that TVA to get the most bang for my buck. So what's that labor of love been like? It has been a lot of understanding the internal pressure um, and abdominal pressure within my core because your TVA is involved in every action you perform, but mainly, well, I shouldn't say mainly, a big part of it is going to be breathing. So something that I've worked on a lot to improve my core has been how I breathe, which sounds a little bit like, yeah, okay, Sue, I get it. But I really can't emphasize enough how much breathing can change how your core looks, functions, and feels. And Alex has also had an experience, which I believe you talk about it in the next episode. So I don't want to have you repeat yourself if you do. No, go ahead. Well, Alex and I both went to James to be able to work on some different things. I was feeling like my hips were a little bit wonky. Alex was having some issues with that rotation and having different balances on the side to side. And when we went into James, Alex first learned that, hey, you're not breathing correctly and you're not really moving your rib cage at all. And that has been huge for you of literally every other movement. If I'm ever in the gym for you or with you, or even if you come back in from the gym, you'll be like, oh my gosh, I can do this now. Watch me do this. And you'll talk about how much better your body moves and how much better supported you are in that engagement and your core looking a lot better as well. Yes. A big part of the last decade for me has just been lifting as much weight as I can and just getting stronger. And so utilizing that internal belt of what the transverse abdominus provides for us in a way that is just for expansion and not necessarily for the control of my abdomen or strengthening my abdomen, if you will. And so 
by shifting my focus of not just filling my belly with air and doing the Vasalva, Vasalva maneuver mm-hmm. and putting my tongue up against the roof of my mouth and just creating as much intra-abdominal pressure as possible and being able to work through breathing using my TVA. Because what I was doing previously was that I was very just lazy breathing, mm-hmm. which I'm sure that many of you listening are probably <laughs> in the same boat where I was just like, I am alive, I have a heart rate, I have a pulse, I can breathe. That's the end of it. But in reality, it is something where I needed to be able to really breathe through my chest, breathe through my lungs more rather than just belly breathing all day. And so that was a huge shift for me when it came to the breathing. And you are correct that James and I get into the trenches on on that topic in the next episode. Mm -hmm. And like when we're looking at the TVA, it's often called like the internal weight belt. And with an external weight belt, so like a literal weight belt that you put on in the gym, the benefit of that is not, oh, it's so stiff that it's just going to keep my core up. That could be part of it, but it's really to help with more pressure creating in your abdomen. So the whole point is to use it to push against it with your core to create more internal pressure so you can go through the movement. And so if you're really looking at, hey, if I can't always wear a belt or I don't always want to have a belt that I use, then work on your internal belt to be able to help that out a little bit more. Um, And this is really going to also assist the diaphragm, which at the end of the day, we want to be able to breathe with our diaphragm. And that's going to be related to some of these other pieces in the core, like I mentioned at the beginning of the diaphragm as part of that inner core. And if you're confused of where the diaphragm is, it's going to be like right up here in your rib cage. Um, Yeah, right by your rib cage, I was realizing that people aren't watching and I said right up here and I'm pointing to it. And so then I tried to think of how to talk about it a little bit better. But basically it's right where your rib cage, right under where that rib cage is, is where your diaphragm is. And we wanna be able to breathe with that and breathe 360 degrees, where what my issue was is that I was really good at breathing laterally because I started to pay a lot more attention to that as I learned more about the core. But with breathing laterally, I just stopped also breathing in front and behind me. And so that can also cause issues of I was having a lot of pinching in my shoulders, a lot of wonkiness um, in my traps, and also feeling pinching in the front of my shoulders. And a lot of that was fixed by just breathing. And that was huge for me because I was like, something's got to be wonky here. And just when I fixed my breathing, I was like, oh, I'm pain-free pressing now. And this is absolutely stellar. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot. And, and As we've talked through this, I'm sure as you guys are listening that you are realizing that you're probably not doing enough within your training to really address and strengthen everything that's going on through your core. And you are not alone in that. It is something that I'm continuously working on. I know Sue's continuously working on and and working it into your program design is something that it can be challenging because it's not going to be like you have a full ab day. You could but it's probably not the best use of your time. And so hard to recover from. (laughs) Yeah. And integrating it into your programming can be challenging. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we uh, move forward. But I think it's going to be important just to really understand all of the daily activities that it's involved in. Yeah. So we talked about breathing, which is a big one for, you know, living life, but sneezing, laughing, urinating, defecating, urinating, defecating, peeing, pooping. (laughs) Thank you. Geez, are we, are we in a doctor's office right I now? I was trying to be professional. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I sit here as I'm itching my foot, um, but most yeah, people can't see that. super professional in your triple XL sweatshirt sitting crisscross applesauce. You know what? Keep showing up. Shout out, Desby. <coughs> Shout out, Desby. Also a great resource for core. She really is. I mean, that was completely unplanned, but she just went through her third pregnancy and she's shown through her past two pregnancies, she knows a lot about core and how to make sure. And you know, a lot of the exercise she posts where you're thinking, oh my gosh, it's going to be like an intense, crazy core routine. You see it and you might be like, that's all. But it honestly is sometimes those smaller, less exciting movements that make all the difference. Absolutely. Okay. So we know that we pee and poop with our abs. Yes. <laughs> we also are sitting up. We are reclining. We're, we already talked about getting out of bed, picking up the kids' toys, picking up the groceries. Bre- we talked about the breathing, lifting, walking. I can tell you for certain 
running. <laughs> I'm sure if you were someone who's picked up the the running game as of late, you realize, holy moly, my abs are so sore and there's so much stability that's being provided by the core as you're running. Like thinking about how much your your legs are moving and then keeping your upper body stable, like your core is doing almost all of that. So it's an important tidbit. And the last thing that Sue has here is just in bold letters, anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you literally are because it's supporting your trunk. It's helping with movement. It's again, holding your organs in place. It's maintaining your posture, which we all have to have some sort of posture throughout the day. It's giving you core support, maintaining consistent internal pressure. Like all of that is involved in basically if not every single thing that we do. Yes. It's interesting because more often than not, when clients come to me saying they have back pain, it generally boils down to something going on within the pelvis or something to go on with their lack of core strength. And if we're able to strengthen their core, we're able to strengthen everything through their pelvis and fix positioning wise, that lower back pain goes away. It had nothing to do with their actual spine itself. It was just a matter of getting everything around it that supports it into a better position. And I, this is literally almost 10 times out of 10, I would say nine times out of 10, I fix those two things, the lower back pain goes away. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. Something else we didn't even mention, childbirth. That's huge within Massive. your core, which we dive in more in the next episode. So if <laughs> you too. haven't already gotten the hint, the next episode's a really good one. It's fire. Um, but I probably am a little biased. I think every episode is really good. Uh, but some other benefits that you get outside of just having a six pack or having those six gills from your obliques is it's going to support and connect our spine, our rib cage, and our pelvis, which then again impacts basically every activity. It also is going to allow you to lift heavier weights at the gym, swim further, and bike longer, run faster. So I'm not seeing any downsides to this yet whatsoever. It is absolutely pivotal in coordinating movement between the opposing I can't even talk. I'm so excited. The opposing sides of the body, because with a strong center support, your shoulder and hip joints articulate more smoothly and your movements are freer. So this really helps athletes or anyone perform at their best and better. I think the biggest thing that we haven't highlighted yet, all those benefits are amazing. And this is what I see very consistently on social media is that it is a large contributor to posture. Mm. And posture being a big part of our day to day, just with one, how we're feeling, but the energy that we are giving off to those around us, because the one who has better overall posture is going to be a little bit more confident. You're going to visually be able to see that um, often with that posture, you're going to visually just look better in general relative to the person who's like slouched over. Um, so a big part of posture as well. Mm -hmm. And think about like if you're, since we've talked about the core being so important on how your body moves, how your body functions, how your body looks, think about if you don't have a strong core, not only is that causing you to your posture to be poor, but that also can contribute to a lot of other ailments. But then it's also looking at the aspect of like you literally cannot support yourself doing daily activities. So you're in general going to be much more down as a person, not only visually, because you can't hold yourself up, but if you literally have no core strength or very limited core strength, then doing things throughout the day is going to be extremely difficult. And when things are that difficult, that's really defeating because it just feels like, man, it takes so much energy to do everything because you don't have the strength to do it. Correct. And I would also add that if you're sitting a large part of your day at a desk and then you're not resistance training, like it is going to create atrophy through the abdomen and you're just not going to carry a whole lot of strength or muscle density in the area. And that's going to lead to pain and discomfort and things being misaligned down the road. And so having the resistance training is a great part of having a strong core, but it is not the entire picture of creating that strong core. Mm -hmm. With that, what are some of your favorite exercises to train the core? One of my favorite exercises is breathing. And that's actually something I put in clients 
training and programming is taking time to sit and breathe with their diaphragm, sending me videos and being able to help them and cue them because you can listen to someone say something, but then taking that into action for yourself, you might still not fully understand what that feels or looks like. And so especially with a lot of my pregnant clients, because we do have multiple coaches on the staff that are perinatal certified, I work with that. But even just, again, clients that are working a desk job, clients that talk about any kind of back pain, it can help with so many people. And it can feel really tedious when I'm like, hey, sit there and breathe for a few minutes. But it has shown huge dividends in how people are able to connect to their core and really talking about the fact that if you are breathing incorrectly, that can put you in a flight or fight minds or um your parasympathetic nervous system can be in that fight or flight because you're not truly breathing the correct way. So it puts people in a place where they're able to handle stress better. They're able to be more relaxed. And that is absolutely huge for a lot of my clients that are very busy individuals. And if we can do something as simple as breathing and think about how many times you breathe in a day, that can change the absolute game. I think that it's probably the most important thing for athletes or individuals who are dealing with high stress, high stress environments, like being able to be in a situation, we'll, we'll have a different example here. Let's say that your kids are being absolutely insane. One is hitting the other, one's throwing toys. They've actually just put paint on the wall somehow. Mm -hmm. And at that point, your head is about to blow off. If you just take that moment to just sit and take some deep breaths in through your nose and count to three, hold that for three seconds and then exhale for three seconds as well, do that a couple of times, you're going to have a better response to that situation because your central nervous system is going to get into a more calm state. Your heart rate's going to come down a little bit. It doesn't change the fact of what they've already done but it does allow for you to respond better. And when we're looking at different situations in our life, the most important thing is how we respond. We can't control what is necessarily happening all the time, but we can control how we're responding to those things. And being able to be in control of your breath is going to allow for that to happen. And for athletes, you see this, like the Patrick Mahomes is a whoop sponsored athlete. And so they have posted after massive games and massive moments in the Super Bowl of what his heart rate was at the time. And it is like at a resting heart rate, I wanna say in the in the 50s or the 60s, you're talking at the most intense and emotion-driven moment of a Super Bowl, he's calm and collected. And in part to that is being able to control his breathing. And he, like his coach and, and his trainer, they've talked about this and he's a big believer in it, where just being able to have that breath control, Sean O'Malley within the UFC, that's another person who speaks very heavily on the breathing and being able to be so calm when you are in an octagon in a fist fight. <laughs> well, all kinds of fight, <laughs> not just a fist fight with 20,000 people around you going crazy and you're able to remain calm because of that control to their breathing. And so if we can take the athletes at the highest moments and just look at our day-to-day -day life and be like, what can we take from that to apply to ourselves to better our situation? breathing is going to be one of those things. Yeah. And I think that people hear that and they're like, yeah, okay, thanks for the great advice telling me to breathe. But I really cannot emphasize it enough of how helpful it is. And also for, again, your digestion, because if you're in that fight or flight, that puts you in a place where you're not in the rest and digest. And so that is going to impact your digestion and your ability to calm down and your ability to do a lot of the things that you need to do. And it's one of those things like drinking water that's so repeated that it kind of just feels like it's in one ear and out the other. But these are the things that actually make a difference. And like you said, even from the highest level down to any normal person that's not an elite athlete, it is going to pay dividends to learn how to breathe. And that's something you and I have talked about of once we learned more about breathing, we're like, once you can control your breathing, you can control basically everything. And that's the way to be in more control of like, yes, I can't control external factors, but I can control myself and feel very confident within that. The last thing I'll say on that is the person I admire the most is the person who's able to stay calm in crazy situations. And that person is the person who's able to control their breathing. And so if I'm, that's the person I admire the most, like that's what I'm going to focus on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's big. Um, okay. Other, 
exercises. Was there a second favorite? Well, I just, you know, went on my whole spiel about breathing. I think that you can give me an exercise that you enjoy. All right. Um, I really like right now, and if you guys have listened to the episode going over back training with Eugene, uh, he and I talked a ton about lateral flexion and being able to move through uh, some different ranges there. So I really like a lateral um, flexion, or we can call it an oblique crunch in the 45 degree um, hip extension. I find this to be an excellent opportunity to better lengthen the obliques and get into a position where you're just not commonly in. Um, so the 45 degree hip extension, utilizing it for a oblique crunch and focusing more on getting the body into an extended position relative to the flexion point of it. Now you're getting into flexion, but really spending time in that more lengthened spot has been a, a favorite of mine because it's just not a commonly trained especially when you're just wanting to improve muscle density and chase muscular hypertrophy, you're not doing a lot of lateral flexion or lateral movement in the movements that you're performing. And so by introducing those, it's probably going to be very uh, new to you. And so it's going to be a great uh, addition. Mm -hmm. uh, another favorite of mine is the TVA crunch. Like I said, love me a TVA and the TVA crunch on like a BOSU ball or an exercise ball has been a favorite since I learned how to do it correctly and truly engage. And that's also been something that I've done a lot to be able to prepare myself for when we do start a family is being able to really engage that without any kind of coning or doming um, to make sure that I am getting that deep, deep contraction and really think thinking of it kind of like a corset that is tightening all the way around uh, my body. And that's the cue you hear a lot is like your belly button to your spine. And that doesn't mean like sucking in your belly button of like just trying to suck in your stomach. It's really thinking about how can I, as I exhale, really push that belly button back towards my spine. And it's part of the breathing process. It's not holding your breath and sucking in. It's being able to like exhale, bring that belly button back and engage that TVA fully. Yeah. And, and with that, you're also going to see your obliques and everything pull in as well. Like I think the corset or the corset is the best example to give with it because you're really trying to see everything pull in and down. Whereas I would say that that's probably the most messed up exercise that I see clients send because they're just sucking into their belly button and then just crunching and kind of like moving on the ball relative to actually contracting the abdomen and then being able to get into that crunch position. A hundred percent. What are some of the other ones you've been either programming for clients or really been enjoying yourself? I really enjoy the uh, the cable crunch. I like the, the gar hammer crunch. I think that both of those are two pretty consistent ones in my program design at the at the moment. Gar hammer crunches are so difficult. <laughs> They're so difficult. <laughs> they are very difficult. And too often, it, a lot of the ab exercises are going to suffer from generating a bunch of momentum from the starting points. And people often do this because they have a high repetition amount that they're trying to get to. Like when people program abs, it's immediately 25 repetitions for whatever <laughs> reason. It's like, why don't we treat it like any other muscle group and let's do like a really good eight. Mm -hmm. Like, can we do eight great repetitions of a gar hammer? Sometimes, and not everybody can, like we just may be able to do a couple and we can make modifications to the bench height and so on and so forth. But the gar hammer crunch is one that can suffer because individuals will generate a lot of momentum through the hip flexors and kind of like fling up their legs. And that can be a, a issue with that movement. Mm -hmm. I have personally been enjoying like a hanging leg raise as well. And then different things, again, doing that rotational um, into the side of like a wood chop or an oblique crunch um, when you are not using the cable. Um, and then an, a favorite that's been a favorite for a while, which I honestly haven't done in a while, this was a good reminder to start doing them some more, were vacuums. Um, and that's really going to be helpful within being able to also train your um, diaphragm because the thing with vacuums is you're pulling your diaphragm up, which then that allows more space for your core. And then you can really be able to like get after it um, with that like belly button to spine. And then we can talk about like planks and, and hollow body holds where we are doing more bracing, um, but that's not necessarily going to be 
under load as it would be within like a squat or a deadlift or something of that nature. But the bracing is useful. Yeah, it's it's really helpful. Like planks are incredible for beginners, especially as they're learning how to use their core. And you can progress it. You can like add weight on your back. That's really difficult to do if you're training alone. Um, and you can progress it by even putting, because normally in a plank, you're keeping your elbows and your shoulders in line. You can move your elbows out in front of you more. And that makes it more difficult as you're going through the movement. So I don't think that it's like, oh, planks are obsolete because they're just bracing. But I think that it's looking, again, well-rounded program of how it looks. If I wouldn't say like just only do planks, but I think that they have their place, of course. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. We've talked about mistakes within training uh, throughout the episode. What are some that maybe we haven't touched on yet? I would say one that, again, I've been on both sides of the spectrum for this one, is the not directly training core. Because mm. I used to be on the side of, I really only do core and cardio, and I'm trying to do 300 crunches. Then I was told by the internet at that time that, hey, you don't need to actually do core movements to like really make sure your core is in the best spot. You need to diet and you need to do compound lifts, which there is truth in the aspect of, of course, diet is going to play a role. Your leanness and body fat is going to play a role in what your core and midsection looks like. But there's actually been a few studies coming out talking about how like in deadlifts and squats that while you are bracing your core, you're not really getting that hypertrophy to the core. And especially because, again, you're not really moving your trunk as you, we've talked about, of these are meant to move closer to one another. They're supposed to be flexion and or rotation, and you're not having that in like a deadlift or a squat. Again, not I'm not saying that you do not use your core in those. You definitely do. But when we look at, oh, you don't need to do any other core work because you're doing compound lifts, I think that's where there's been kind of a discrepancy where it's really helpful to still have direct core work. It's just depending on the amount of direct core work. So I literally went from ton of core work to like no core work for years and then figuring out more and learning more and changing my opinion on it, which I think is also something powerful to mention that you make mistakes, you learn, you change your mind, and that's something that you can do as a human being. I don't even know if it's necessarily that you make mistakes. It's like you were just doing, doing what yeah. was the best at the time and then your knowledge expanded. I don't think that you were intentionally making a mistake. Yeah. Um, and I also believe that there is a progression to the direct core work. Uh, someone's not well-trained in general. I don't think that it's going to be overly necessary for them to do the direct core work at that time. We've got to get our foundation into a better overall position for them to be able to have coordination to move properly. Um, so I think that having some individuals, it's probably going to be best that we're just focusing on the compound movements, understanding time constraints. Can we focus on breathing outside of that? Because I, I will say with a majority of my clients, uh, they have an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, four days a week. We have a lot that they want to accomplish from a body composition standpoint, not to say that the core work is not important, but when we look at everything, can I kind of check the, the boxes by doing some of these other things potentially, right? And so with that understanding, I think that there's a balance to it all. And I, I still am working on it for sure within the program design. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's a, a full picture approach that you need to look at of what are the parts you're trying to improve, what are the parts that you are missing out on, um, and what does your total program look like. But I think I was saying more so of it doesn't have to be 
no direct core work and only do compound lifts or you are someone who always talks about direct core work, I think it is going to be very individualized per the person and their goals. One thing I hope everybody takes away from this series is that program design and exercise selection, how you structure your training is so gray. It's not as black and white as Instagram and other social media platforms want you to believe. There is a lot of give and take and individuality that is going to be most important. You want to have a mixture of the science that we understand within resistance training and hypertrophy and being able to also have what you enjoy and what's going to be the thing that allows for you to train over the long haul. And if, if you're only creating programs, which I have fallen into this boat when I first started coaching, that was just to the T from what the research was stating. They did this many sets, they did these exercises, and I'm giving this to my client because they want to achieve the same goal that this study did. And I will tell you that that got very few actual results. When I shifted to the mentality of finding the balance between enjoyment as well as the structure from the research and combine those two things while also taking into consideration of what that person is not only enjoying, but how they like for the sessions to be able to flow, that's where I had the most overall adherence from my clients. And that was the greatest results I had because guess what? They were in the gym most frequently and also having the greatest results by pushing themselves within the movements that they enjoy and the, then the structure to the training that they enjoy. Yeah, I think that's so important to mention because that's a huge thing that I've learned from you uh, is that it's not just by the book. You have to really look at how it applies to each person, which just shows not only is it gray, but it is so, so, so individual for each person. Mm. And one other thing I want to mention here, because you might be like, oh, this is going to be so much work. I have to learn how to breathe and now I have to spend all this time breathing, that your TVA and your pelvic floor are actually anticipatory muscles. So over time, when your inner core unit is functional, you won't need to be aware of cueing your pelvic floor to engage. Uh, so it's something that over time as humans, we we lose that rhythmic pattern of breathing sometimes because of stress, trauma, anxiety. So it's just about bringing ourselves back to that. But once we have that foundation, then again, our muscles are going to remember that and be able to be in a good pattern to move forward. Awesome. Great. So since we already did talk about some of those other mistakes of the breathing incorrectly and some coning um, or bulging, then I wanted to go into some questions to wrap things up. Sure. Let's hear them. All right. Is training abs necessary? <laughs> I think at this point in the episode, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Does training abs cause constipation? Not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've heard before? That was a common question that was received. Does training abs cause constipation? Do you think that if you trained abs so hard that you, for whatever reason, couldn't contract your core to poop? I think it could be that of like being so sore that you can't poop. But I think more than anything, not training your abs could cause constipation because you could be in the place of not being in that rest and digest and not using your core properly. Uh, but it can also be of you don't have the core strength to like give a little bit of a push there. Not saying that you should be like trying to actively push every time you go to the bathroom, but just as something to take into consideration there. Um, yeah, I, I haven't personally come across that, but it was a question that we got, so I wanted to make sure we answered it. Okay. Will training abs make them more visible? Will training abs make them more visible? So I'm going to say yes in terms of being able to improve the density of the muscle tissue. It's not going to be a one-for-one -one correlation, right, because you're going to improve the density, but then by – having a calorie deficit, losing the body fat, that's what's going to make it more visible. But there are a lot of people out there that have been on the thought process of, if I diet, then I'm going to have these stellar abs and they just haven't done any core training to begin with. And then they diet down and they still don't have those abs. They don't have strong obliques and it just looks like a rib cage with nothing really in, <laughs> in, the, in the middle of it. And you know, avoiding that is going to be stemming from having resistance training in place that's training the core. Mm -hmm. Will training abs make my waist bigger? To the person who asked it, no. But there is going to be a little bit of a caveat depending on where you're at body fat wise. And I want to make this abundantly clear is that if we 
increase the density to our obliques. We, f- we create more muscle density to that area and you're also carrying body fat. That's going to shift what that waist measurement is going to be. Now, if we're just training the rectus abdominis, that's not going to be the case. But I also want to be very clear of just all the variables that are going to go into it. Mm-hmm. Can core training reduce belly fat? So from a literature standpoint, this is not going to be the case. You are going to need to lose body fat just in general to be able to um, see the abdomen. I personally think that there is some level of um, reasoning to where we're having greater circulation of blood flow if you are training the core and there being potentially better overall partitioning of nutrients in the area, things being broken down um, from a cellular perspective. I mean, we're getting super into the nuance. This is my hypothesis. This is my experience of what I have seen. I do not think that it is going to be a one-for-one correlation, but I do think that there's some connection that has not been found yet. Well, there actually is a new study going into that, and there have been some found findings. There definitely needs to be more research. This is not conclusive of like, hey, all of a sudden now we can spot reduce fat. But there is some really exciting research that's showing that you can spot reduce to some degree because of exactly what your hypothesis is. So you're ahead of the curve. Look at that. Well, I'm not ahead of the curve since you already, when, do you have anything to expand on with the, the paper? I don't have it off the top of my head because I don't want to miscite something. But if you do go to the show notes, I will have Bill Campbell um, with his Body by Science research did dive into that specific research study. So I'll have that link down below um, from his March issue. Amazing. All right. Last question. Does training your core help with back pain? It does. Strengthening your core, not necessarily just training it, but being able to strengthen it, moving through full ranges of motion. Yes, it's going to aid and improve uh, just your how your back feels. Perfect. Well, I think that there was a ton of information in this for people to be able to take into their training and their day to day. Is there anything else when it comes to the abs or the cores that you wanted to leave the listeners with? Don't program 25 to 30 repetitions of crunches. Do better crunches. And learn how to breathe. That is our ending note there. So hopefully you join us on the next one when James Fryer joins us to talk all about the pelvic floor and the core. And we'll catch you in the next one.